Today, I'm talking with Malcolm Nance, a national security expert who has called everything from Putin's disinformation war to Trump's insurgency of the Republican Party and America. He also is the author of the upcoming book, They Want to Kill Americans, The Armed Militias, The Fanatical Terrorists, and The Deranged Ideology of the Coming Trump Insurgency. You need no greater introduction than that because people ought to know who you are already. So, Brother Malcolm, welcome to the show. My pleasure. So, first off, I just want to ask you as a, an American who is watching everything that's going on, also as somebody with military experience that you have as a security expert, you're watching everything that's going down, man. I just want to do a mental health check on you brother just to make just just to just to ask you how are you holding your shit together given everything that's going on because we're supposed to be acting like everything is normal and we know damn good and well that it's not well you know i think it's i mean i'm holding together very well uh you know i've i've got a lot of experience in being in crisis situations and uh you know so there, i've been in a lot worse positions but the things that have been happening certainly the last five years <clears throat> have all been national security threats on a strategic scale, which have had geopolitical impact. Uh, you know, the degradation of NATO, the coddling of Russia, um, you know, a president who, whose best friends, uh, he calls himself lovers with a North Korean despot who killed his relatives with 23 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, right? Um, you know, a, a Russian president that uses the single most dangerous chemicals and poisons on the planet, including polonium, which can only be refined from a nuclear reactor that's creating plutonium, you know, an atomic bomb byproduct. So, you know, things have recently changed and we've seen that our hard effort in defending democracy is, is starting to pay off. But the risks around the world are, are only becoming more fraught as we consolidate. About five months ago, six months ago now, I started writing a book where I was, I was seeing that the alt-right, the people who had their coming out in August of 2018, um, you know, this conglomeration of neo-Confederates white supremacists, fascists, neo-Nazis, and just, you know, white militiamen were shamed for a very small period of time uh, with, you know, the, the post-Charlottesville, you know, opprobrium that the country had put down on their activities. And what I found between 2018 and 2020 is that these groups didn't go away out of shame. They were molding themselves into essentially becoming the paramilitary arm of the Trump campaign. They were all fierce, ardent Trump supporters. And so they changed, they turned in their tiki torches and essentially put on the uh, red Make America Great Again hats, the MAGA hats. And that led me to believe that there was something moving amongst the the, the 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 Trump right that could only build into what I would see as an insurgency if Donald Trump had lost. And in fact, when I was pitching this book, um, which some people wanted me to call it the Trump army, but I said, look, I don't ever want to write another book about Trump. <laughs> so only two options were going to happen here. If Trump won the election these people would become the brown shirts, right? They would become the semi-official paramilitary of the Trump campaign, and there would be nothing to hold them back. But you have to explain to me what the what the brown shirts are, though, Malcolm. Yeah, the brown shirts were the first iteration of Adolf Hitler's political paramilitary. Uh, the, 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 their actual name was the SA, the Stormbelight uh, Abteilung, and they were enforcers. And they were the guys who marched around like Boy Scouts, right? Wearing brown uniforms. But they enforced this, this image of, of, of strength of Adolf Hitler. The problem with the brown shirts is they got a little big for themselves. And Hitler, being a megalomaniac, didn't want any force to be 
larger than him. So um, after they had carried out Kristallnacht, which is the night of uh, the broken crystal, where they went around and attacked Jews all over Germany, um, they were gutted. Uh, the head of the organization was, was actually killed, was ordered killed by Hitler. And then their, the remnants of them were transformed into another group later on called uh, the Schultzstaffen or the SS. Right. Right? The bl all black wearing political, military, official enforcers of Hitler's world. And this is where people get the feeling or where I got the feeling, certainly last August when I started writing this book, as the Black Lives Matter protests were breaking out in the United States, Suddenly, militiamen, armed groups, the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, the Oath Keepers, this new rise of young men who had no military service but wanted to, uh, you know, act like they were their own militia, the Boogaloo Boys, they were all coming out of the woodwork, but they all had one thing in common. They were wearing the MAGA hat. They were wearing Trump's red hat. And that became, I saw that as the new symbol of the brown shirts, Trump's brown shirts, a paramilitary enforcement organization that was taking it into their own hands to be Hitler's, uh, listen to me, to be Donald Trump's sort of enforcement group. What do you say to people who feel like your assessment that they are the brown shirts is a bit too extreme? I'm not saying this is every person who's a Republican. You know, full disclosure, you know, when I was back in the military, I was a Republican, uh, you know, but an old school kind of Colin Powell Republican that is now a far left liberal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm only calling into to question the people who in the last month have proved themselves everything that I said. In fact, you, you might recall I was uh, three days after the election. Um, Bill, I was call, I was on Bill Maher's real time with Bill Maher in Los Angeles, and I made the assessment that hey, this isn't going to go smoothly. You know, I said Joe Biden might be elected president, but what I see is the stirrings of insurgency. And when I meant insurgency, I meant a political and paramilitary rejection of the of the you know the elected government which would uh, manifest itself through po strong political opposition and possibly paramilitary or terrorist acts in order to discredit the government and show that it was powerless to stop them in support of that political party's goals that being Donald Trump out of power and, you know, by the end of the show, uh, Bill was going like, well, we've got to do kumbaya. We've all got to get along. We can't, you know, call all these people racist. And I said it on the show. I go, hey, these guys voted to be racist. They voted for this. They are proving what they stand for. And so, you know, by the end of the show, the remarks of a, you know, me being doom and gloom warning of a paramilitary insurgency or a political certainly a political insurgency, which is stage one of all insurgencies, was already manifesting itself by the end of the program. Uh, Trump was already rejecting uh, the, the, the vote count. He was rejecting the, cert, you know, the certification of the votes from states. He was already saying he had won the election. You know, the first components as as they are written in the U.S. Army and Marine Corps counterinsurgency manual is, you know, a political opposition uh, designed to discredit a, a dutifully elected government. And that's where, the, you know, Donald Trump was taking his political activities. Fast forward 90 days, right? You know, I'd hate to be the one to say it, but my, my fans make up fun names for me. And, and one of the most interesting from a radio host called Fernando Monde said, I'm going to call you Nanstradamus. <laughs> and, you know, I used to joke at that and laugh at that. Now I'm starting to think, you know, for the last five years, I've, I've called a lot of things. And these, these, aren't, these aren't prognostications, right? These are intelligence analyses where I can see a pattern of known facts. And because unlike journalists and these amateur internet sleuths and 
who are out there saying they're, you know, open source intelligence analysts. I'm an actual intelligence professional. And I balance everything that I see based off, based off of what I've read, uh, my experience across 35 years operating in the black, you know, the dark shadows of the geopolitical espionage world. And, you know, I'm a significant kind of intelligence collector. I mean, I started out in signals intelligence. And we like to say that signals intelligence is the purest form of spying because I don't have to buy anybody, right? I don't have to rely on someone's word or their trust. I get it from your phone call to your mistress, okay? I get it from the information that you think is secret between two of you. So people, I like to think that, you know, people who are in signals intelligence have an ability to, to create a cleaner uh, uh, intelligence prognostication on the basis of experience of knowing when people are lying and when they're not, when they're BSing somebody on a phone call and when they're not. And so a lot of the information that I collected uh, in the run up to this book, you know, I wasn't a journalist going out and talking to militia men and interviewing them. I actually had a, a publisher tell me that they, they didn't accept my proposal for this book because they wanted a, journal, a real journalist to do a deep dive on this subject. And I said, yeah, a real journalist will do this. They're probably doing it now. I said, but my book will be out two years ahead of theirs and it will be far more accurate. <laughs> you know? so, um, so that's how I came to see this pattern of, of, of information. Many people were collecting it, but I fought insurgencies. I have actually had to deal with insurgents. I've you know, had insurgents uh, try to kill me. You are trained to deal with insurgencies abroad, but a lot of people don't know. They, they can't wrap their minds, particularly around white folks, right, who are doing this stuff. They can't wrap their minds around these white folks, these Trump people as yeah. being foreign enemies. And I'll tell you the reason why. I think it's because, one, we're accustomed to Muslims, to Arabic-speaking people, and to the Iranians. Now, even though, here's the thing, Malcolm, you know this and I know this, the, the, the Iranians are Persians. They're not Arabs. Right, which is a whole nother thing. Right, we're used to people from the Middle East being the enemies and being the people who are trying to unravel American democracy. And so you said something to me. You said something basically that black evidence is not to be believed until white people confirm it. So I want you to go into why isn't that people like you aren't able to you know, give this information, give this, um, you know, this this intelligence briefing that you're giving to us essentially for free and not taking heed to it so we can protect our country. Why, why aren't people heeding that? Yeah, that's an interesting factor. And, you know, like I said, my publisher, uh, my agent actually has a, uh, a professor who is writing a book about what they, she calls black evidence. And the premise is, is that information, no matter how accurate it's from, you know, no matter how distinguished or scholarly it's from, from African Americans, from brown people, Latinos, people of color, um, the inherent biases and prejudices of the of the typical consumer of that information who are white is that it's not to be believed until it's confirmed by a white person. And I've experienced that firsthand over the last four years. I mean, let's let's be honest. If if you know, when I came out and said um, in July of 2016, you know, the, 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 the hacking of the DNC was the Russians. There was a lot of evidence to that effect. I had been seeing patterns of that well before it got into the news media that, that the DNC had been hacked. In fact, one of the first pieces of intelligence that I saw that I immediately recognized as a foreign intelligence disinformation operation, I was brought on to um, hardball with Chris Matthews. And it was about a report that Vladimir Putin and his top five advisors 
had 20,000, all had hacked and had all 20,000 of Hillary Clinton's emails, and they were debating as to whether to release that. And I was brought on to hardball as the intelligence professional to determine whether this report was viable. Now, I just want to point something out to you. That report came from Judge Napolitano on Fox News. And I had seen that report two months earlier on a, a, a bizarre, what only thing I could call is a right-wing loony website uh, with some weird names that didn't seem to make sense. And it was like a footnote. In reading that information, I went on air and I said, this information's impossible. I mean, it's what we would call crown jewels intelligence. You know, knowing what the top five guys are saying to Putin in Putin's Oval Office, there's no way and no intelligence source is going to give that up, right? So that being said, um, I knew instantly that this came from the Russians and that it was designed to, like a baited hook to hook the right wing. And Judge Napolitano bought it up on Fox News. And that, three months later, literally led to Trump saying, Russia, if you're listening, please release the 20,000 emails that Hillary that you have from Hillary Clinton. It worked. At the same time, the Russians were then starting to release the stuff they had hacked from the DNC. As an intelligence professional, I saw this as a strategic intelligence operation carried out by professionals who, you know, did this all the time in the Cold War, were only realizing it was really effective in, in the modern post-Soviet Russia. Um, and it would later, we would later go on to see multiples of these things. But when I said this, in the news media, first person in all U.S. news media, I was immediately dismissed as a conspiracy theorist. And for almost two years, even as the media was collecting all of the exact same information, good journalists were coming out two years later after I had written Plot to Hack America and my second book about Russian intelligence and how they did this, The Plot to Destroy Democracy, uh, including how they co-opted the alt-right um, and the, uh, the right-wing Christians and the NRA, then I would find out, like, for example, Plot to Hacker America came out in September 2016, 45 days before the election. Everything in it would be verified by the Senate Intelligence Committee, the House Intelligence Committee, the CIA's uh, uh, report, on the Russian hacking, and then later by the Mueller report. Same thing with Plot to Destroy Democracy. Um, and then the next book to come out about it, which was lauded to the high heavens, was David Korn and Michael Isakoff's Russian Roulette. But it came out 26 months later. Yep. <laughs> you know, after my book. And look, Russian Roulette's a good book. It's really good journalism. David David Korn was the journalist who had the steel dossier. It was a solid book. But, you know, one of the reviews I found was quite interesting where they said, excellent book, well-resourced, a long, slow version of Plot to Hack America. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. There was actually an incident um, where I had come out with my last book, Plot to Betray America, and I did a really easy softball interview on Morning Joe with, uh, with Willie Geis. And I stated a fact. I said, Donald Trump has been under surveillance by foreign yeah. intelligence since 1977. And he is, that means Czech intelligence under Ivana Trump was monitoring him. And in fact, according to Luke Harding at The Guardian, Guardian and the Czech news agency that had all of the original files, that means that by the time he had gone on his trip to Moscow, the, you know, in 1988, the KGB already had 11 years of intelligence collection on him. 
And, you know, and Vladimir Putin was a former KGB officer turned the first director of Russian intelligence, the FSB. He would know everything about Trump. He would have psychological profiles that went back decades, right? And then, boom, out of nowhere, all of these journalist bros literally lied. We had a, uh, not Breitbart, Mediaite wrote an article that literally fabricated quotes from me where they said, I claimed Donald Trump was a Russian spy going back to 1977, 40 years. When you talk about Russians and intelligence, like they have, you know, the, the Kremlin, they have centuries of, of intelligence. And listen, I don't think, and this, as somebody who's a, who, who's works in intelligence like yourself, I'm pretty sure that you'll tip your hat to Russian intelligence officers. They are the best. They are the elite when it comes down to compromise and whatever. You know, the the people who do the best, the journalists in Russia who do the best work on, you know, the Soviet intelligence uh, agencies. Uh, I'm going to name a few people in some books so that people can learn and, t- and get a lot of background on what you're talking about. Uh, it's a journalist duel of Andrei, uh, Andre uh, Sudotov, uh, Sudotov and Irina Borogin. And so they have a series of books that deal with Russian intelligence. You know, one is called The Patriot Games. Uh, yeah, Sudotov, right. Excuse, yeah, thank you, Sudotov, exactly. You know, um, the new Patriot Games, how secret services have been changing uh, their skin. Then he had, Then they have another book uh, that right. deals with uh, the the red web, the struggle between Russia's digital dictators and the new online revolutionaries. And uh, they have another book out there, a recent one that came out in 2019. Right. It's called The Co-Patriots, The Brutal and Chaotic History of Russia's Exiles, Immigrants, and Agents Abroad. They have been skilled at doing this for not just decades, for centuries. You know, the thing that people don't recognize, everyone focuses on the Soviet Union. People don't realize that the Kremlin, they were, you know, they, they had a, a hundred, a hundred years um, long uh, rule at, you know, during, you know, a czarist period. And so they were spot, you know, they, they had their spy corps trained and developed long before the Soviet Union came into existence. And so the idea that, the Kremlin is able to infiltrate us. They've been doing this for a very long time. So all these things that you're talking about don't come as a, you know, it, it doesn't come to a surprise as me as somebody who studies this, but just letting all of our listeners know this, this shouldn't come as a surprise at all. But listen, Malcolm, I want to move into something else, right? You know, uh, I want to move more into your expertise in the Middle East. And so, you know, you know, right now, and I'm and uh, Joe Biden and his team are pursuing options on uh, how to best return to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or what's popularly known as the Iran deal. So, you have some experience dealing with the Iranians, so I just want to talk to you about your engagement with them and why you think we need a diplomatic approach to Tehran over a military one. I remember you on MSNBC saying, does America have the largest military on North Earth? Yeah, but do we want to fight the Iranians? Nah, that's not the best idea. So you have experience. I want to talk to you about why you said that. Yeah, you know, interestingly enough, I was I was called uh, before the uh, Democratic Caucus uh, before coronavirus. And they were, you know, it was because we were having all these standoffs with Iran. And they wanted to, to hear from someone who had actually fought the Iranians. And I had, you know, even though I'm an, I'm an Arabic uh, specialist, I'm a Middle East specialist, uh, the very nature of where I operate took me um, into the teeth of Iranians, uh, the Iranian paramilitary and terrorist forces across the Middle East and South Asia. Uh, my first deployment anywhere in the world was Beirut, Lebanon in 1983. At that time, Beirut was embroiled, you know, Lebanon was embroiled in the civil war that was exacerbated by the Israelis' invasion. They were backing the Christians, the Shia Muslims in the south, in the, you know, in the, in the highlands of Lebanon. The Alawites were all, you know, broke, had been broken down for years into sectarian militias. But then Iran, after the fall of the Shah and the rise of the Ayatollah Khomeini, started a strategic plan to strengthen Shia communities 
across the Middle East, the Arabian Gulf or Persian Gulf, however you want to choose, uh, in Pakistan, in Yemen, and other places. And they found that the largest concentration was in southern Lebanon. And to do that, that would actually bring them into direct combat, direct conflict with the Israelis who had, had invaded Lebanon. So, of course, the United States got involved. As you may recall, we landed Marines at the airport and were supporting the semi-sectarian Christian-backed government uh, in their ability to stave off Iranian influence. That led to the suicide bombing of the American embassy uh, in April to, uh, 1983. And in fact, I arrived in Lebanon 48 hours before on a ship and I was part of the, the Navy's intelligence collection uh, organ that was operating offshore. And, uh, you know, s steaming into that place, brand new, you know, guide to the Middle East first deployment, 48 hours into my first deployment, the American embassy is devastated by a suicide bomber. 89 people are killed. And that very day, every CIA officer in the country happened to be meeting at the top of the building in a secure space and they were all killed. I believe there were nine of them. And so all US human intelligence died 48 hours after my arrival. And that only left signals intelligence and other source intelligence like imagery to start picking up the pieces uh, before they could get other officers to come in and try to use networks or do liaison with the Christians. And so that was introduction number one, the first one in the 90 days that would lead to hundreds of Americans dying, um, you know, us in direct combat with the Iranians, but seeing the Iranians use uh, clandestine intelligence services as a terrorism arm, that was new. So, you know, I was in Lebanon when we were in combat with the, uh, the Shia militias. Um, when um, the Marine Embassy, uh, the Marine Barracks was bombed on the same day that the French Foreign Legion Barracks was bombed, the Israeli Corps headquarters was suicide bombed. It was really the heyday of the Arab suicide bombing world. But all of these devices were constructed by Iran. They were, you know, Iranian intelligence backed massive multi ton suicide car bombs. And uh, then began the hostage takings and the attempt, the embassy bombings uh, throughout the 1980s. I was involved in all of those things. And they were all pretty much involved. They were pretty much backed by Shia militias like Hezbollah, what would become Hezbollah, or at that time was Amal, the Amal militia, and would become Hezbollah, which would be a powerful force. Um, and then in the Arabian Gulf in 1988, I was in direct naval combat with the Iranian Navy. Uh, you know, I was on a, a vessel where we blew up their most productive oil platform and all the rev guard that were on board. We sank a warship with all hands, all Iranian hands lost. Uh, then we shot down an aircraft that was stupid enough to come out and kill that crew. Um, you know, and we helped savage the Iranians in one 24 hour, you know, not even 24 hour, it was actually more like a five hour period. We, uh, we destroyed everything that was there, but you know, the Iranians got their licks in too. I mean, they, they almost sank a U.S. Navy warship with mines. And then I was in Iraq, you know, dealing with Shia militias again, you know, being bombarded by, you know, Iraq, Iranian back Shia militias. So, you know, when I go on television, uh, we're speaking about Iran. The first thing I say is, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm the only person here who has ever been in direct combat with the Iranians. <laughs> you know, they're not they're not to be trivialized. First off, there's there's 80, I think it's 80, 80 to 82 million Iranians. That's almost as many as there are Germans. And they're very well educated. They are very politically savvy. And they are people who look, I, I often joke that I know what the average Iranian wants. The average Iranian wants a 2021 Toyota Corolla. <laughs> you know, they want to be left alone with their family. And we're really in opposition with the regime. 
which does have strategic plans to, you know, maintain that arc of Shia influence, the Shia crescent, going all the way from the Golan Heights um, back around to southern Saudi, you know, all the way around Syria, Iraq, Iran, back across the Arabian Gulf, up into Yemen, into southern Saudi Arabia. It is literally a crescent now. And it was, I'm afraid to say, that crescent was built by George W. Bush and Donald Trump. Break that down. Why do you say that? Principally because the gap in the crescent was um, the Alawite government of Assad in Syria. First, uh, Hafez al-Assad, then his, you know, Hollywood son, Bashir al-Assad. So the Shias were always left without a base of influence. And that's why Iran established Hezbollah. They were sort of pressuring the Alawites from the West, knowing that there were, you know, in Iraq someday, they would get rid of Saddam Hussein and that country that was 70% Shia would fall under Iran's influence, right? Then you would have an arc that extends from southern Lebanon, literally uh, on the Israeli border, all the way across to Tehran, and then back through, you know, southern Iran to Baluchistan and, and Pakistan, right? And then you would have to jump over Oman, and you could get to northern Yemen. But George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq gave Iran and um, Iraq and Syria to Iran. Just boom, flat out gift. And even though the the the, the, the Alawite government, which is a, a a sect, an Islamic sect minority, working with the Christians of Syria were initially backing the Ba'athist of Saddam Hussein's political party, who were Sunni Muslims, it became clear after Saddam was killed that the real money was to work with the Iranians. And that's why, I mean, they had already had open relations with Iran. They were allowing Iran to ship in weapons through Syria into Lebanon, right? But now you had a Shia rising Iraq. And that country would um, now be able to, if they wanted to, exercise influence with Shia groups inside of Syria and destabilize the Alawite government, the Alawite Christian uh, and Druze government of Syria. So, of course, Assad did what was more expedient, which was start working with them, start working with the Shia, right? And especially when the Civil War started in 2011, he needed all the assistance that he could from Sunni Muslims who were rising up uh, and joining ISIS and fighting him as revolutionary groups. So he made a full alliance with the Syrians, uh, the, the Shia, including bringing in Shia militias from Iraq um, to fight in Syria. And that gave Iran the northern arc of the Sunak, of the Shia crescent, going all the way from the Golan Heights to uh, you know southern Lebanon, the Golan Heights, all the way to uh, Baluchistan in the southeast. Then, with the help of Donald Trump, um, the Saudis and the United Arab Emirates invaded Yemen in an attempt to limit Iranian influence in Lebanon, in Yemen. And what that did was that unleashed ISIS and Al Qaeda in Yemen, and it created a civil war where Shia. Um, Muslims could be directly shipped and aided by Iran to the point where they were bombarding Riyadh, Saudi Arabia and destroying their oil fields in the south with ballistic missiles they never had. So instead of just being guys with little Panjar daggers on their belt riding donkeys, right? right they became this Iraq-style, you know, Shia militia that was devastating the armies of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. It's just ridiculousness on all sides. And Trump, of course, was full support to the Saudis. Therefore, the Iranians were like, screw it, full support to the, to the Houthis. Yeah, you're going to have to deal with them anyway, right? So I think this conversation about isolation, it hasn't worked because people presume that we don't have to deal with them, and we do. Like, this isolationist approach to Iran was stupid. It never worked. And it, it has never made any sense. 
And then another thing, too, is that the Iranians will be able to create to create chaos through their terrorist um, networks for decades to come. And that's not anything that a conventional military can combat. The insurgency in Iraq should have taught us that. Right. And, and, and so we all are just taught that a conventional approach is the way that you win wars. We know that doesn't necessarily work because it's not about the conventional war that comes about. It's the insurgencies, which you've been talking about. But, you know, the thing that Barack Obama understood with Iran in regards to the Iran deal is that, look, if we have to fight Tehran, I would rather fight them in a conventional war than a nuclear one. My question is, how did how well did that work with North Korea? Right. Isolating North Korea. The way that we engage people on the foreign policy perspective is never black and white and is never straightforward. So to answer your question, it doesn't work. OK, so let's just be clear. It doesn't work. There are a lot of people who would say we have more in common culturally with the Iranians than we do with the Saudis. Yeah, culturally, you could say that only because they are an extremely sophisticated population. And when I say sophisticated, I mean very well educated. They understand how we do things. Um, of course, where the, the fault line lies is our inherent racist bias against religion. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty r- racist against just anybody who, who comes from another religion. And when you consider it's an Abrahamic religion, that's uh, right. <laughs> that's a pretty amazing statement. And many people in the foreign policy establishment, particularly the 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 um, the, Amer- uh, the the conservative foreign policy establishment, see everything through a you know a Judeo Christian perspective that require, requires them to hark back to you know the Peloponnesian War or you know the Battle of Thermopylae as seen in the movie 300, or the Crusades. And, you know, these are people who have no problem thinking that the Knights Templar, you know, uh, instead of being genocidaires who went to, you know, the Holy Land and just killed all those peaceful Christians, Muslims, and Jews, right, take up the bridle of, of political crusade using these values that we have. Uh, and that's how we got you know, that's how we got, uh, you know, the Shah of Iran, the, the Pala- Reza Pahlavi dynasty. We just thought it was cool and sophisticated to put in kings, uh, uh, you know, in 1952, instead of, you know, allowing the Iranians to have self-determination. I mean, the British got into trouble with that, you know, uh, in 1956 when they invaded Suez. They just, everything was ours before, therefore it's ours now. And, you know, the the, the era of self-determination was was coming to a head. And so, you know, same thing with Batista in Cuba, right? We'd rather have a right-wing dictator than, you know, a guy who's espousing any form of socialism. Uh, I can name a young man named Ho Chi Minh. Yeah, yeah. He literally <laughs> came to the United States in 1947 and begged for help to... To establish a liberal democracy, and our response turned him into a raging Maoist, right? Which is a Chinese agrarian communist. And thus, we could have saved hundreds of thousands of lives, if not millions of lives, gotten solid democratic republics under our belt, if only we had listened without, you know, a lot of people were the old men of foreign policy, a lot of them were the white diplomats who saw the world in those, you know, aristocratic black and white world states where you had to back white people and oppose, you know, the black, the whites in French Indochina so that they could run plant slave like plantations because they had wine there as opposed to, you know, establishing self-determination for for people who live there. And the same with Iran. I mean, these are foreign policy errors. And, you know, interestingly enough, I was called by, I had met by complete accident, a guy who would sort of become my mentor, um, uh, who was a, 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 a George Bush, George H.W. Bush conservative. Um, and I had met his wife on a flight to San Diego. And uh, she said, oh, you really need to speak to my husband. And at that time, 
I had a counterintelligence or counterterrorism uh, um, consultancy in Washington, D.C. And this, by the way, was, you know, just before 9-11. And um, after the, um, the uh, invasion of Afghanistan and operations in Afghanistan, he contacted me and I was in Georgetown in D.C. And he said, hey, let's 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 have a talk. And what was happening was this was September 2000, um, September 2002. And we were going into the buildup of the case to invade Iraq. And he pulled me aside. He goes, you're a Middle East, you know, intel guy. What do you think about this raw intelligence that Bush, George W. Bush had declassified of Iraqis at a weapons depot trying to find bombs with chemicals? And so I had listened to it carefully as a professional. And I said, this is the stupidest effing call I've ever heard. Now, I can't really get into the technicalities of it because that would bring it back into intelligence. But I said, it's one guy going, hey, man, I've got some orders here for you to look through the depot and see if we have any of that old stuff from the Iran-Iraq war, that's old special bombs. And somehow George W. Bush and Dick Cheney took that and turned it into they are hunting and trying to conceal chemical weapons. And I was like, I have been to an explosive ordnance warehouse. All right. This is a guy who's the equivalent of a corporal. <laughs> OK, being asked to find junk that is in the million, the, the middle of hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition. And I'm like, no, this is two stupid corporals or maybe a corporal and a sergeant, which they were using as a case to invade and destroy Iraq. And you know what? That guy was like, man, I see that, too. You know, but these guys are hell bent to invade this country. And they did thinking they were going to create. And I swear to God, a new Middle East version of Germany which w would be our springboard to invading Iran. And it's like, uh, you know that country's 70% Shia, right? <laughs> I mean, you want to invade Iran, you would have needed this Saddam Hussein. You have to know what a Shia is, though. Oh, my God. You would have to know the difference between a Sunnah and a Shia. And no one in the Bush White House did, nor did they care. Remember when we started invading and they started doing invasion planning? This is old school old school, why we hate the Bush administration. They literally told, literally told the State Department they would not need any of their Arabist, right? Any of their Middle East experts. Fast forward to me, I'm getting paid a boatload of money to train special operations people, SEALs and special boat squadron guys on Iraqi dialect prisoner handling, right? And it got so severe, I was like, man, this war is coming. And I literally asked the secretary of the Navy to bring me back on active duty. And, you know, I'd save you like 10,000 bucks a week. I have a, someday I'll, I'll put this up on one of my Twitter pages or something. I have a letter from the secretary of the Navy literally telling me they will not need any Arab linguists. Malcolm, listen to me, man. Like I, I was, I was, I'm, I, I was speaking to a woman, um, we're actually doing a uh, a profile of her in the next couple of weeks, and she was doing research on think tank folks in D.C. who study Iran but can't read fucking Farsi. Okay, <laughs> you know, like these are the people who go on shows and they say we know everything that's going on in the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's one thing, like to not know, like they can speak it. They were not able to read it. They were not able to understand it to any degree. And these people had to rely on actual Farsi speakers. And, and not only that, listen, besides the language, they didn't even have any time in the country. And so it just shows you a lot about how this, this think tank base that goes in based on their aristocracy and their Ivy League and their elite right. school education talking as experts, but they don't know what's going on so nothing that you're saying man actually surprised me so i want to go in and close out i'm going to move on to uh saudi arabia 
in Yemen and Biden's decision uh, in that region. And I'm going to read from the Associated Press. So uh, President Joe Biden announced Thursday the United States was ending support for a grinding five-year Saudi-led military offensive in Yemen that has deepened suffering in the Arabian Peninsula's poorest country, calling the move part of restoring a U.S. emphasis on diplomacy, democracy, and human rights. And I quote, this war has to end, Biden told diplomats in his first visit to the State Department as president, saying the conflict has created a humanitarian and strategic catastrophe. The Yemen reversal is one of a series of steps Biden laid out Thursday that he said would mark a course correction for U.S. foreign policy. That's after President Donald Trump and many Republican and Democratic administrations before his often sided with authoritarian leaders abroad in the name of stability. Ability. And so this move, the AP continues, comes as a rebuke to Saudi Arabia. Now, now, uh, Malcolm, given how much and how close the U.S. is to Saudi Arabia in a wide range of ways, what do you think about Biden's reversal? Well, I'm afraid to say it that it's a it's a solid move. And there's going to be a need to be a lot of reserves for reversals with Saudi Arabia. Okay. And look, I lived in the United Arab Emirates for 10 years. I've worked in Saudi Arabia. I've worked with the Saudis uh, in, in the invasion of Kuwait in, in 2001. I worked with Saudi forces. Um, and I, you know, I speak Arabic, read Arabic. Uh, granted, I don't read Farsi. Uh, actually, I can read it. I just don't understand it. I'm not a Farsi linguist. But, you know, um, there, there is something to having uh, a solid understanding of who you're dealing with. And the difference between Trump and Biden is that for the first time when Trump showed up, and trust me, I've been in the Arab world for 36 years now. When Trump showed up for the first time in American history, the Saudis saw a president they could buy. I mean, literally money on the table. Here's the glowing orb. You understand where we come from. Here's our palaces. You didn't know that we, you know, these Bedouins had ginormous, luxurious palaces. Uh, you know, the, the King's Palace in Abu Dhabi has, has, a, has seven domes that are three times bigger than um, St. Peter's in, in Rome. So all lined with gold, by the way, real solid gold. So, you know, they understood Trump as a person who was a transactional president and that he was the American they've always been waiting for. Greedy, avaricious, would agree on the basis of how you dealt with their families. Literally Game of Thrones, right? Because that's how they behave. Everything has to do with paying off the king, the king's brother, the king's aunt, however, right? Getting some leverage over the other one, getting some blackmail, and then you understand each other, okay? And I've seen that my whole career. And in fact, I made my reputation in Iraq for being the American that couldn't be bought, OK, so and I, I literally went into that. I knew it would throw them all for a loop. Trump was not that guy. Trump was the American president that could be bought. Jared Kushner could be bought. Ivanka Trump could be bought. Anyone of influence can be bought. These people wanted to be oligarchs. They didn't understand that the Saudis were like the original oligarchs, the oil shakes. And then he got there and they were like, oh, this is going to be easy. We can do whatever we want. The United Arab Emirates has decided that they want to be an imperial power. And we're doing expeditionary warfare against Iran, who had real power, because Iran could step in and invade that country and, and probably take it in a matter of days. I mean, I took part in some of their counter Iranian planning. And, you know, as I said, my experience with Iran is quite narrow, but very important. I fought them directly. <laughs> and the, when I fought them, that was a different world than Iran now. Those people learned the lessons of our 
butt whipping that we gave them. They've got thousands of anti-ship missiles now. They've got hundreds of thousands of sea mines. They've got hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of commandos that they could land and blow up every oil field in the Arabian Gulf and shooting oil to the price of $500 a, a barrel. These guys aren't to be a joke. And there's 80 million of them. There's only 25 million Saudis. You know, and less than, you know, less than 800,000 or half a million Emiratis. So there's no defending against these guys without America. But by going with Trump, they created this fantasy world where they could all get their licks in and, and, and resist Iran on this scale and feel like they were doing something to the point of destabilizing Libya, right, which I haven't quite figured out. Um, and, 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 and doing this, this, like I said, expeditionary warfare around the world. Now Biden is coming in to spoil all that. He's coming in to inject hard ass reality into American diplomacy led by diplomats, not grifters who, who were, uh, who were being mediated for by a Arab American convicted pedophile. Right. And child porn purveyor, you might recall that. Uh, and then uh, that person was mediating for a, uh, you know, one of Trump's power brokers in the United Arab Emirates, who was also being investigated and Trump pardoned just recently. That's not going to save any of these guys from state charges. They're all going to prison. But Biden is back and saying, you know, that four years of you picking our pockets and dealing with people who were just thieves, you're going to find out that that's not going to happen again. It's not. You're going to have to deal with hard reality. But some things came out of this which were very interesting. The new Gulf states uh, Israeli dynamic, which is interesting because it essentially puts you know, by, by managing the safety of Israel and literally handing Israel Palestine and the Palestinians and ending almost once and for all the Palestinian question, the, the Emiratis, the Saudis, the, the, the Bahrainis, the Kuwaitis have essentially secretly and tacitly put themselves under the Israeli nuclear umbrella. The, the happenings in Chad, Yemen, Somalia, Mali, Upper, you know, Burkina Faso. I was about to say Upper Volta. That's how old I am. Uh, Burkina Faso, Niger, Mauritania. All of these things are intertwined now with the Gulf states and, and Trump's policy. And now we have to determine whether we're going to actually negotiate our way out of these things. Look, don't forget, Trump also gave Afghanistan to the Taliban. And, you know, in the next few weeks, we have to determine whether we're abandoning by military force, abandoning Afghanistan to the Taliban, which will lead to a mass slaughter of everyone who has ever trusted the United States since 2001. Well, we'll call you uh, Nastradamus. <laughs> Nastradamus. Nastradamus, listen, you are a go-to intelligence source for me, you know, when I'm at the root and when I'm from Black Diplomats, my podcast, man, and I always bring on folks uh, just to make sure that we have these perspectives and we need you. And so I definitely believe you and I'll never question you uh, second guess anything that you do, man. So listen, I really appreciate you for coming on Black Diplomats and, um, you know, giving us an intelligence primer, man. We I, listen to me. I appreciate and the audience appreciates it. Well, it's, it's my pleasure, and I, I look forward to seeing, uh, hearing more of this podcast because, you know, and, and now you know, most of State Department is run by a professional black diplomat, uh, you know, and uh, I think that our voices in diplomacy, even though I come from the, uh, the military side, you know, you can't be in military intelligence uh, and, and, take the, and take the job of, di of diplomats. Uh, the State Department is a critical, critical component, and I'm glad it's been reestablished, and I'm, I'm sure this podcast will lend to that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're going to do that, man. So we, we've done the show. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and um, we're out.